Welcome to the Primetime Podcast. This is Primetime James Thomas, and welcome to episode four of our breakdown of the Vince McMahon docu series on Netflix called Mr. McMahon. And today we're gonna we're gonna be discussing Vince McMahon versus the media. Bill Mushnick, Bob Costas, Richard Belzer, and others. This is probably the least interesting element, but also the most revealing when it comes to Vince McMahon and himself. In in every part of the story so far, Vince talks about how much he likes to fight and how much he likes comp- he likes challenges, confrontations, but he doesn't seem to do very well at them. You know, John Stossel, episode 1, he gets smacked by Dr. D David Schultz. He shows up at the, w- at the WWF to do a expose. Now, Hogan in the documentary tells a story that John Stossel was supposedly was coming in to find out how popular Hulk- Hulkamania really is. So he's kind of lying to get his foot in the door. But once his foot is in the door, he starts telling the boys, oh, you use a razor blade to cut yourself? You're you're lying to the audience. This is not wrestling. This is fake. And because, you know, the boys are the boys, they're trying to protect them of the business, they go to Vince, and Vince says, well, somebody needs to do something about it, according to Tony Atlas. This leads to Dr. David Schultz to smack John Stossel. But Stossel is an interesting situation because a few years later, Vince, of course, will go on television and admit that wrestling is just entertainment. So John Stossel got smacked for no reason. <laughs> now they didn't talk about it, they didn't talk about in the documentary why Vince decided to go public with this. It's just entertainment. They just decided to not bring up the deregulation that him and Linda worked on to change pro wrestling in in the various states like Philadelphia, New Jersey. So they could cut taxes and different things like this. And this is very important to the world of the business because it's very important to the growth of the industry. Because to a degree, you don't even get ECW without Vince and Linda getting wrestling deregulated in Pennsylvania. You don't get Ring of Honor if they don't work with the Athletic Commission in in New York, in New York and New Jersey. So the Northeast area really benefited from Vince and Linda saying that wrestling isn't real. And going into these governments and saying we shouldn't be regulated like we are real, we shouldn't be regulated like boxing, and MMA wasn't a thing yet, but we shouldn't be regulated like boxing, karate, or anything like else. So John Stossel got smacked for nothing. He got smacked, he just got smacked for being disrespectful. Not because he exposed the business, because Vince himself went on to do that later. But he was just being a disrespectful little asshole. That's all it was. And that sets the stage for Vince and Bob Costas. And Bob Costas is the most interesting thing. He's very interesting. Because I did not know that Vince and Bob Costas was on David Letterman together. Let alone Vince doing David Letterman. I did not know that, but both Bob and Vince was on David Letterman. And... I, I just never sat down to watch the episode, but but these two knew each other from their younger days. And Bob Costas participated in the rock and wrestling in the 80s. As Vince is on the rise, Bob Costas comes in and does some ring announcing. Bob Costas in the documentary is talking about how much he liked that product. You know, the Hogan era, you know, he thought it was funny, it was entertaining. It was, you know, right up his alley. It's what he preferred. And then Bob withdraws. Around the time Desert Storm happens, Hulk Hogan's fighting Sergeant Slaughter. They're burning Iraqi flags, and they're doing this stuff, and Vince is trying to discuss how sometimes they rip storylines from the headlines, much like Law & Order. You know, this was going on in the world. We're going to do what's going on in the world. And Bob Costas says, look, I was supposed to be involved with WrestleMania 7. I backed out because it was just, it was tasteless what they were doing. 
And I gotta give Bob Costas credit. I give him, I give him credit for that. The whole Hulk Hogan Sergeant Slaughter storyline. Yeah, one of think was all that great. Granted, you know, I'll I'll give Sergeant Slaughter props for doing what he did. Very ballsy move on his part. But the match wasn't really very good. The finish wasn't really good. And it was all just a ploy to get Hogan back in the good graces of fans because of this was after the steroid accusations. Now, if they would have went with the idea of the original idea, which was Sergeant Slaughter just turning heel, still very pro-American, but he doesn't like the way how he doesn't like how the country is looking going forward. Kind of, but kind of not like Bret Hart before Bret Hart. But maybe things would have been different. It might have been fine. But the Iraqi sympathizer element was a big turn off to Bob Costas and to a lot of other people. Normal people, by the way. One of these things we do learn in this documentary, that Vince is not normal, okay? So Bob's relationship with Vince is strained around 1990, 1990, 1991. Then the XFL happens. And this is when they have their big blow up. Because I wish, me personally, I wish I hated something as much as Bob Costas hated the XFL. Well, well, well that, that's a lie, because I, I do hate Alien 3. I do hate um, a lot of movies. Halloween 5, Primetime Movie Network. Um, that's my secondary channel, my movie channel, if you're interested. But anyway. But but Bob Costas and Vince McMahon had to sit down a conversation about the XFL. And Bob Costas talked about how, the, how much XFL is a really bad product. It's a terrible product. It's crude. It's too much WWF. Not enough sports. The play and the players are terrible. And this is not a good product. And he confronts Vince with this about the epic failure of XFL. And Vince gets defensive. On Vince's side, he talks about how we kind of expect that Bob Costas to be tough. That but he also, but they were friends. And he thought there would be some friendliness to it. But Bob Costas is a neutral reporter. He is pretty legit. And Vince, once the pressure came, for all his bluster about loving challenges, liking the fight, he's incredibly sensitive. <laughs> These criticisms that Bob Costas was putting on Vince are true. For one, they're true. Well, XFL sucked. It was garbage. The ratings were in the shitter. There was too much WWF in the XFL. All these things were true. It was a massive bomb and a waste of, of a lot of people's time and money. But Vince gets defensive about it. I mean, it's also true that he talked about, about that he, it's also true what he talked about in this documentary, that he knew nothing about football when he started the XFL. He just did it because he could. He wanted to try something new. And, and that's why, you know, I always say, you know, Vince McMahon, promoter first, businessman second. A lot of Vince's business ventures outside of wrestling have not been good. The WBF, the, the restaurant in New York, the XFL, never really works out. Wrestling is the one thing that happened to work out. And then Vince goes on on Bob Costas, and he tells Bob Costas, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a businessman. I take risks. This is what makes America go around, which is a good response to, to this thing being, being an epic failure. Hey, sometimes things fail, bro. And Vince had a lot of failures, like I said, a lot of failures. But he got so defensive that it, that he escalated the situation, sitting on the edge of the seat, leaning in, getting in Bob's face, pointing at him. I mean, it looked like Vince, it legit looked like Vince wanted to fight. It legit, you want to let me finish your pal? Like, he, it looked like he legit wanted to fight Bob Costas. And, and credit to Bob Costas, he kept his cool. 
He's sitting there, legs crossed, watching Vince perform, quote unquote. He's not, he's not getting agitated. He's not getting concerned. He ain't tripping, even though Vince is trying to take things to the next level. And even all these years later, Vince is sitting there thinking about how much he wanted to kill Bob Costas. And as smarmy as Bob Costas can be, and somewhat disingenuous as he can be, Vince is huge in comparison. He's the guy with something to lose here. But what you see is Vince is very impulsive, right? It's a, uh, it could go from zero to 100 real quick, real quick, especially when he's flummoxed and he doesn't know what to say and there's no handlers there. We see this a lot with Vince. This is the most obvious one. This is the one people point to the most when, what kind of person, Vince McMahon, let's watch him go off on little Bob Costas, who just criticizes him and criticizes the company, well, the XFL at least. And Vince is ready, is ready to, to pounce on, on, on Bob Costas, who's much smaller and much obviously weaker. And he looks like a bully. He looks like a bully. And in the documentary, he still talks about how much he wants to kill Bob Costas. He wants to strangle him with his hands around his neck. And this is a guy he thought was a friend. He felt betrayed by Bob, apparently. But this sets the stage, of course. John Stossel getting slapped for, dis for being disrespectful. Vince thinks that Bob Costas was being disrespectful. He wants to kill him. So if he wanted to kill Bob Costas for criticizing XFL, can you imagine what he think he wanted to do to Bob? The, the, can you imagine what he wanted to do to Phil Mushnick? Phil Mushnick is a New York Post reporter who exposed the Ring Boy scandal. Apparently, Tom Cole approached him and told him about the Ring Boy scandal. Then he wrote about it. And it became a huge national national story, and Vince and Vince ended up on Donahue, where he got embarrassed by that by that con man, Rory Hutchinson, Bruno San Martino, superstar Billy Graham, Dave Meltzer, John Arezzi. They're all there to talk about sexual harassment of young boys, it's steroids, etc. And Vince, and Vince is in the fire. It's him versus all these people. Anytime he tries to tell any stories, one of these guys pipes in about how it's not true. The documentary does this a lot. Vince saying something, and then we cut to something else not being true. And it's good for dramatic effect when Bruce is talking about how Vince is a human being, and then it cuts to two days later, Janelle Grant, the Janelle Grant thing happens. Very entertaining stuff, by the way. But back to the Phil Mushnick, Phil Mushnick element. Vince and Phil Mushnick apparently never, they never met. Mushnick, despite being the guy who wrote the articles about the steroids trial, despite writing about the Ring Boy scandal, he never made any public appearances about it. But he says, if, but he says Vince McMahon is a dirtbag. And how he got all these letters from sources over the years Talk about how terrible Vince is, what of a terrible person he is. And he was the only one in mainstream media willing to stand up and talk about how bad the WWF was, how bad wrestling is. And I say, look, he has some legitimate critiques, yes, but it did borderline go into the personal between him and Vince. And I'm pretty sure that he could have got his hands on Phil. If he wanted to get his hands on Phil Mushnick, on Phil Mushnick, he would have. If Vince wanted to get close to Phil, he could have. But Phil Mushnick, who's writing an article saying that Vince is witness tampering or he's paying off witnesses in the steroid trial and all this stuff. Phil Mushnick seems to be pretty much. Phil Mushnick is, seems to be the only one walking that that pretty much feels like he's guilty. Even to this day, he still feels Vince is guilty. He discusses in some articles that he contacted Donald Trump and tried to convince Donald Trump not to hire Linda McMahon because Vince was running a death mail. 
He's he's running he's running steroids to the company. He's running a pedophile ring. And the fire went both ways. Vince himself will go after Phil Mushnick on television, especially after the steroid trial was over. And then, of course, Jim Cornette went after Phil Mushnick. So the relationship between Vin, between the two of them, the rivalry, I guess you could say, where Mushnick would say something out of pocket, it would trigger Vince, and Vince would tr- and and Vince would, would respond. The entire steroid trial on Phil Mushnick, because Vince would blame the steroid trial on Phil Mushnick. I'm sorry, because he's writing articles. Vince ultimately blames Phil for the entire steroid trial and said that he was an FBI informant, in which Mushnick said, yeah, I was. They were reading my articles. It's one of those very interesting, it's one of those very interesting relationships where Mushnick is looking for something, anything to bring down Vince. And it finally happened with the hush money scandals. And he's thrilled about it, of course, because now it says I was right 30 years ago when I said the guy's a dirtbag, he's a scumbag, he should never be anywhere near the White House. Your children should be, shouldn't be watching the WWF. Finally, somebody's going to prove me right. It just took until 2022 to do it, and it wasn't me. It was somebody else. But hey, blessings comes in all shapes and sizes. The gym, of course, is, is the army and contain footage where Vince is taking no responsibility for all the wrestlers that are passing away from 38 to 45. It is a true glimpse into how defensive and impulsive Vince can be. It's an interesting scenario because he, he, what this guy is looking for is just for Vince to show some humanity. That's really all he's looking for. He's not looking for Vince to say anything in particular. He just wants Vince to show some concern four of these guys who are passing away at, at a very young age. And look, Vince's, res- and Vince's response is perfectly accurate. These guys are grown men. They were doing drugs. They were taking steroids. They live a hard life. They pass away. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them, some were drug overdoses. Some were heart attacks. These things, it's unfortunate. Celebrities die often. Wrestlers seemingly die more often than celebrities. It's an issue we need to talk about. It's certainly something that we should be discussing. But Vince flies off the handle and slaps the paperwork, slaps the papers out the guy's hands. And you're like, his impulse control is low. His frustration tolerance is seemingly low. And when he's not in full control, you never know what he might do or what he might say. And for a guy who likes to fight, who likes challenges, you would think he would welcome this this type of thing. But he's not very good at it. Again, like they talked about when it comes to Bob Costas, he got baited. Well, he got baited on Donahue. He got embarrassed in Donahue. This Army Katayan guy embarrassed him too. Bob Costas embarrassed him. This is, it's, and it's all because Vince doesn't know how to answer for these things. These things that are happening in the wrestling business that may or may not be his fault. And whenever the situation occurs where People are looking for an explanation of why did the show continue when Owen passed away? You know? What do you think about these wrestlers dying young? What's going on with Chris Benoit? What you get from Vince is something that is so detached from everything else because he's protecting the business. And by the business, I mean pro wrestling and his company. 
He can't say that pro wrestling is the cause of Chris Benoit murdering his family. He can't say that because then he has to accept that it's possible that these guys are destroying themselves in the ring and there could be outside of the ring consequences. He can't admit that. that he can't admit that their lifestyle of being a pro wrestler, the constant travel, working with injuries, can lead to these guys using drugs rec recreationally, especially painkillers, because it has to change how he does things in order to prevent that. And he ultimately, he did eventually, but we're talking about in the moment, in the moment, he didn't change anything and he wasn't looking to change anything. His, he doesn't like being criticized, even though he says that he doesn't mind it. He doesn't reflect on these bad decisions, these poor interviews. He doesn't regret doing them, you know? He doesn't mind people criticizing him. He just wants the ability to fight back, you know? And I can't believe they skipped over the stand-up for WWE campaign. That is tremendous to me. They didn't go into that. They didn't go into the parent councils blaming WWF for the death of their children. They missed that, too. That seemed like prime documentary material right there. There was a little bit of it when they talked about the Attitude Era, you know, and how violent it got and how edgy it got and that parents need to, need to monitor what their kids are watching. But Vince had – Vince – was on edge about that too when he was confronting about their about the marketing materials saying that children should put your parents to bed or something like that and then he would tell everyone that oh we're not for children anymore this is for the 18 to 34 year old because there's breast and blood and chair shots in the head and all these things which people are right to criticize but he's not quite sure how to even in the documentary itself there's this beautiful scene where Vince is explaining the attitude era where he's saying it's still family friendly and there were no knives no guns no rapes no deaths and each time he says nobody died there's casket matches and buried alive matches there were no knives then there was choppy choppy your pee pee or someone has a sword there were no guns Brian Pillman with a gun. And then he says, it's still family friendly, just for maybe a more adult family. Which is a wonderful Vince McMahon twist. It's the kind of Vincisms. It's it's the type of thing that I realize that it's the type of thing that I would expect Vince to say. So Vince is defending the company. That's one of the things that is the glue of him. Button heads with John Stossel, Bob Costas, Phil Mushnick, and Richard Belzer, who gets choked out by Hulk Hogan later on. Well, earlier, before WrestleMania won, because Richard Belzer was making fun of Hulk Hogan, and he, got, and he got choked out for it. Vince wasn't happy about it, but at the same time, he didn't get punished. It cost Vince a couple bucks, but it was no big deal, ultimately. But Vince is all about protecting the business, protecting the company. You know, he doesn't want what Chris Benoit did to be blamed on the company or to be blamed on the industry. You know, even when he talks about Owen Hart, he says that, oh, we weren't trying to bury Owen. We were trying to make Owen a star. And then talked about the defective clip when it was a wasn't when it was a defective clip. When I wish people stopped saying that it was the equivalent of using the wrong tool for what you're trying to do. Not to go too far into it, but just because you might be interested, look, try using a Phillip head screwdriver when you need a flathead screwdriver and vice versa. That's what happened with the Owen Hart clip situation. They were using a clip 
that was best used on the ground because because it, it, it was a quick release clip. It wasn't it wasn't meant to be used while you're dangling a guy thousands of feet above the ring. That was not the appropriate usage, and it was still sold to them as if if, if as if it would work. So, so they still managed to sue the manufacturer, and they made a lot of money out of this because the manufacturer were lying about how it could be used, but it wasn't defective. It was that that they purchased the wrong clip, the wrong kind of clip for the kind of stunt they were trying to do. So Vince is protecting the company. Always, always protected comp the company. And and again, and this thing was not mentioned in the documentary at all. Probably should have been. The absolute disgusting Melanie Pillman situation. When he brings Melanie Pillman on the show expressly so that she could say it's not steroids that killed Brian Pillman. He brought Brian Pillman's wife on Raw the night after. The night after Brian dies. That was him trying to protect the business. Vince's obsession with the business. Vince has gotten himself into a lot of embarrassing situations as being the guy who's trying to protect his company. His company's reputation matters to him far more than his own. And I'm pretty sure he will be happy, thrilled to a degree. That in the, at the end of this documentary, after they destroy Vince in episode six, they talk about how great the WWE continues to do. Merchandise, attendance, views, everything's up with Vince gone. He's probably like, at least the company is going good. At least the company isn't getting buried. Bury me, but not my company. And for a guy who everybody thinks is a narcissist, this is not quite a narcissist personality. He never goes after these people for coming after him personally. He goes after these people when they attacked his company. They talk about, in episode six, um... Why does Vince bring back people that sued him? People who leave, people who trash talk him personally. Why does he bring them back? And Vince says, you know, I'm a businessman. I'm willing to swallow my pride to do business. It's good for the fans. And some people are saying, is, that a, is, is it a control thing? Does he like having control over people? And maybe they're... You know, some element of that here. I can't say that there's zero percent that. But when you look at the entirety of McMahon's confrontations, his public fallouts, his hostility with the media, he doesn't take it personally when these guys are attacking him. When people say bad things about him, he can forgive that. He can look past that. As, as he said numerous times, he doesn't really care about what people think about him. And, of course, usually he goes on to say you question whether or not it's true or not. But with Vince, it might literally be true. It might literally be he doesn't care that people think he's a rapist. He doesn't care that people think he's a terrible boss. He doesn't care that people think he's cold and unsentimental and human almost. He doesn't seem to care much at all. You don't see any emotional reaction to all the negativity that is thrown at Vince McMahon personally. You don't see that it affects him personally. But attacks on the company will definitely do. That's what affects him because that's his life. And so, yes, the impulsive nature of him attacking people for going after the company reminds me of Erica Badu that and it reminds me of Erica that Erica Badu quote where she said I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit that's what it reminds me of attack the man 
but not the company. But let me know you guys' thoughts, how y'all feel about Vince McMahon and his, uh, his relationship with the media. Hit that like and subscribe button. Give your thoughts in the comment section. And I'll see y'all later for the very last edition of the Vince McMahon Breakdown. And I am out. Peace.